Okay. Se escucha nuestra voz. Can we? Hello. Uh, no. Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. Right. Yes, hi. Hello. But I think he's mute. He's mute. He has his he's microphone mute. Okay, let's check. Ah, no. Okay, let's try now. Let's see. Test. Yeah. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Tilt the camera yes. a bit so I can see who I'm talking I to. I sure will. I'll give you, it's uh, for some reason, there is not a flat surface, but I will give you. Oh, a that's track. a little better. So, Hello, everybody. So there are um, about 50. We're, we're missing a few. They'll be straggling in here. Uh, I will try to give you a shot where you can feel like you're talking to us and see us. That sounds good. That looks good. Thank you so much. Jose, are you, are, you, are we set? Yes, I was set. Audio yes. and video, everything was looking good. Mm -hmm. So Professor Galbraith, they have had a thorough introduction, so I'm not going to use additional time to introduce you. They know full well who you are. We've done the reading, we've discussed the reading. I don't think I stepped on your toes by uh, anything that I did on Tuesday, but we're delighted to have you with us. And I know that the class has enjoyed not just your essay, but Zach's book. Uh, now we've read about four chapters from the book. And I think everyone agrees that there's just so much in there that is exciting and fun to talk about. And we just look forward to hearing from you. And if we could save 15 or 20 minutes for some questions at the end, that would be ideal. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, and they, we have an hour and 10, is that correct? An hour and 10 minutes? You know, we, we go until 2.35, 1, 1.35 your time. So an hour and 20 oh, minutes or so, yeah. 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 Okay, uh, well, that's uh, excellent. Let me, let me uh, just quickly pull a uh, time piece here so I can keep an eye on myself. Oh, um, do, you, do you want to share your screen or you just- I do, to... yes, I do. Okay, yes, I, I, have, so... I have some thoughts on that. Okay, sure. so okay. we have given you that. There you go, you have the ability to share. Very good. Okay. Um, uh, so the, um, first of all, it's a pleasure to to, to be with you uh, and uh, have a chance to just to review some some concepts which are very central to yeah, right. uh, to, to my identity personally and to the uh, to the area uh, of economics that I've been identified with for my entire professional life um, and it's also also as always a great pleasure to be uh, in, a, in a, even in a virtual room with Professor Kelton who's a, a, a most esteemed colleague and a, a real force uh, in the development Development of economic thought in the United States and around the world, in fact, at the present time. Uh, so I have the impression uh, that you have had some discussion so far of the setting uh, that uh, essentially led to the intellectual development and the emerging into prominence of John Maynard Keynes. Is that is that is that right? Uh, essentially, that the, you you've you've talked a little bit about the Versailles Treaty and the and the economic consequences of the peace and uh, and the uh, that underlying argument. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not hearing a response to that, uh, and the camera is yes, pointing me at the ceiling, so I can't see. Uh, my, I can't see my audience. What happens to that? Very slowly. Back down. Uh, okay, yeah, a little more. There, there, there we are. I can see at least some of them. So you know, if you're in the in the view of the camera, feel free to nod heads, wave hands, or otherwise. Uh, uh, make it make make reactions felt as I go along. So uh, on on that on that assumption, I thought I would just say a quick word that would give you my you know, sort of capsule view of what's really important in the uh, in in the in Keynes's 
uh, formation in the, in, in the sense of the, the thinking that he brought to his later work uh, out of that earlier period. And if you ask me to sum it up in a, in a sentence or two, I, I, I just say that what Keynes lived through was the um, psychological, the collapse of the psychological foundation of, uh, 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 of the Victorian age, of an era of, uh, of certainties, of an era of uh, moral uh, commitments and particular kinds of moral beliefs. Uh, and that he he lived through that in his youth in the Edwardian period and the you know, philosophical uh, rebellion that he was part of in early 20th century Cambridge, uh, England. Uh, and then, uh, but especially uh, in the cauldron of the, of, of the Great War, which in the economic consequences of the peace, he, he, he says very clearly is uh, uh, just destroyed the, the psychological foundation of the previous society and the the balance between uh, a capitalist class which held uh, saving and accumulation is to be the highest objective and a working class that uh, was prepared to accept uh, this very slow improvement, but nevertheless improvement in his condition uh, on, you know, on condition that the, that, the, uh, that the improvement actually occurred, which was, as Zach Carter says, the essence of the, of the, of the double bluff. Well, the, 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 as he says clearly, the war revealed all of this to be illusory, that the ruling classes were not fit to rule, and the working classes had no real reason uh, to respect their judgment or to limit themselves given what was uh, clearly shown to be possible. So uh, the foundation of the society had been shaken. Uh, and one might argue that uh, the collapse of the 1920s in Britain and after 1929, 1930, the United States you know, was the consequence of this uh, in, a, in, a, in a broad sense. It had obviously a financial uh, aspect and the boom and bust of the stock market that came to an end and boom that came to an end in October of 1929. But fundamentally, it was a, it was a breakdown in the structures of um, control and accumulation and investment that had it had lasted for 50 or 60 years uh, before that, at least. Uh, so something had to be done. Uh, and um, the alternatives were, were, were clearly were clearly present uh, in uh, people's consciousness from the 19, from the 19 teens and 1920s onward. Uh, fascism was one that began to emerge in the early 1920s, mainly in Italy, but with, with close ties actually to the United Kingdom. Uh, and that was sort of a merger of the high capitalist classes with a militaristic state and a strong repression of the, of the working classes and, a, and therefore a, a very extractive and repressive uh, form of society. Communism was another, repressive also in its own way, but uh, they, but its, it's basic uh, uh, credo and it was, was the abolition of, of the capitalist classes and the vesting of that function in a central planning uh, mechanism of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a powerful state uh, working, it was said, in the interest of the whole population of the working population. Um, Neither was a particularly attractive alternative to Keynes for Keynes because neither uh, left any place uh, for the kind of uh, liberal democratic uh, and uh, uh, at least in his view cultured ethos uh, that uh, uh, that he was that he was brought up in and that he valued um, and there was an alternative uh, it was prefigured uh, to a degree in 1929 by uh, uh, election campaign of David Lloyd George, for which Keynes wrote a large part of the platform, we can conquer unemployment. But it really came to life in the United States in the New Deal uh, in beginning in 19, uh, March of 1933 with Roosevelt's inauguration. And what was the New Deal? Uh, the New Deal was a kind of, you know, it was a typically American thing. It, it, it lacked a clear ideological definition because it was basically a combination of every single idea uh, that anybody had come up with in the previous 30 years for how to deal with, uh, uh, with, 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 with the various problems and crises of capitalism, uh, you know, populism, progressivism, institutionalism, the, the legacies of German social democracy that uh, had... Um, 
come down to, from through places like Wisconsin, the progressive tradition, uh, Catholic social doctrine, you name it. Also, an admixture of socialism and communism that weren't terribly important pieces of the picture. But basically, every kind of reformer flocked to Washington uh, and participated in this. And one of them, uh, I have to say, in 1934, the summer of 1934 was a young agricultural economist who happens to later have become my father. So this is all part of the nascent of our, of our family uh, history. Uh, anyway, what was the New Deal? Uh, New Deal had components uh, that uh, just covered just about anything you can think of. One of the very earliest things was something called the Agricultural Adjustment Administration, which controlled uh, set up controls on, on, on planting and uh, stabilized prices and try to bring an end to the uh, uh, to the uh, enormous slump in agriculture, which was uh, devastating rural America, which was still very at that time very very large part of the population. Financial reform, which to say the Emergency Banking Act, uh, which separated um, the uh, uh, investment banking from commercial banking, so as Glass Steagall law, uh, and uh, and created a system of insurance. Uh, on your bank deposits that would uh, forestall uh, or at least keep ordinary people safe uh, from runs on banks and the loss of all of their savings and all of their all of their household assets. Public works, and I'll, I'll show you a map momentarily of the scale of the public works construction of just about anything you can name and anything you can mention was built in this period was built it with New Deal money. Uh, I was noticing it even there's a section of road in Stony Brook, which is a, a New Deal project. I couldn't tell you exactly where it is, but it's, it's, a, it's I'll come to that because there's a project called the, the Living New Deal, which has gone about documenting the, the, the extant, mostly still extant sites where the New Deal made construction. But fundamentally, uh, there were a thousand airfields, every rural school, every courthouse in the country, uh, a, um, about 600,000 miles of roads. Uh, and there again, a little bit of family history. My father emigrated from Canada in 1930 and went out to Berkeley. He came across on a ferry to Cleveland, bought a Model T with another student, drove out to California in the Model T. Um, gasoline was 10 cents a gallon in those days. Um, and he made a note that from Lincoln, Nebraska to the California line, they did not encounter a single paved road. Uh, by the end of the 1930s, those roads were paved. Uh, and of course, many dams were built and the, the, the rural America was electrified through the Tennessee Valley. Uh, uh, authority and other uh, public power authorities all over the country. So you had a tr just a massive transformation in the, in the core infrastructure of the country. Employment on top of the public works, there was there were large employment programs that people could find work uh, of all kinds of different work, um, but work that did not necessarily lead to large construction projects and was suitable for other people. Social insurance that came along. This is when social security was created. This is a, uh, a you know, uh, fundamental uh, uh, bulwark of American society to this day, permitting large numbers of people to retire as early as age 62. Before that, there wasn't any. Uh, minimum wage was another thing. Labor rights, the rights of right to unionize came in in the middle 1930s. It was a very substantial conservation environmental element. The country had been afflicted by the Dust Bowl uh, and uh, soil conservation was extremely important. Planting of trees, well over a billion trees were planted. Something that actually Franklin Roosevelt had developed as, in his time as governor is so he realized that the farmlands of upstate New York were, were, were uh, depleted and they couldn't be used for, for crops in a competitive way. So he put them into a crop that grows over a longer period, which is trees. And those trees are still there. Uh, they're, they're, that's the forestation of the East Coast, which wasn't there in the 19, beginning of the 1930s, is there now. And there was a large element of, of also art, of work for artists and writers and uh, actors and musicians, all kinds of things. The New Deal, in other words, created this very eclectic and very wide ranging system of, 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 of public and public private institutions uh, that uh, uh, basically brought the country back from uh, its uh, um, state of, of practical collapse, averted both fascism and communism, and also set the stage for the, for the mobilization that led to the uh, victory in the Second World War. It's a big deal. Keynes was, of course, very enthusiastic about it. 
This was, uh, in some sense, the, sort of the, the physical counterpart of what he had been urging in Britain in 1929, uh, and an underpinning of his own thinking about how things should be done. This is a map from this project, The Living New Deal, which I highly recommend to you just to explore their website. Uh, it's uh, 16,000 dots uh, on a map of the United States. Each one of them is a New Deal project. Uh, and if you just look around your own neighborhood, New York City and Long Island, uh, you can see they're all over the place. And when you look at the map, uh, you can click on any dot and pick out any 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 piece of it that you want from the Lincoln Tunnel to the St. Patrick's Cathedral to all kinds of things that you uh, that are, you are just part of our daily existence uh, actually came to be as a result of the, of, of the public investments of this time. Um, okay, so let me turn to Keynes uh, and uh, I'll, I'll turn to Keynes. What did he try to do to bring, uh, and during these years, 1933 to 36, uh, uh, even a little bit before, he was largely working on trying to persuade his fellow economists uh, to start thinking in a fresh and uh, different way about the um, uh, about how the world actually works. Uh, and those he he. Uh, he confronted an, an economics profession was really very similar uh, to the one that you might pick up in an introductory textbook from a less uh, enlightened professor than Professor Kilt, uh, in which the fundamental construct was this balance between supply and demand and their markets, and they set prices and you know, give you output results, and there's equilibrium uh, if everything is left alone and the government doesn't play any role in it. And there's no such thing as society or the larger economy as a, uh, a, a unified uh, entity. Uh, and this is what Keynes was really about in developing his book, uh, The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money. It was really about attacking that. Uh, it wasn't about just simply creating uh, a kind of uh, super model in which the government plays a role uh, controlling the, the, the high levers of economic policy. It was about redefining what, how economists should think. And in what terms? Well, the, 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 the character on the, on, the, on the right here uh, tells you, uh, and it tells you, uh, it's done by the same cartoonist who, do, who does the drawing of Keynes. On the left, I happen to own an original of that David Lowe drawing of Keynes in the armchair. And I found this one of Albert Einstein. What was Einstein all about? Keynes knew I had met Einstein. He'd read at least the, the, the popular versions of the special and general relativity. Uh, he uh, quote, had quoted from Einstein's references to uh, the basis of his theory and the departure from Euclid's geometry. And he says as much in the gen his own general theory, the classical economists are like Euclidean geometers in a non-Euclidean world, whose only recourse upon seeing that lines have apparently parallel or colliding is to rebuke them for the unfortunate collisions that are occurring. Uh, it's a direct reference, direct, unmistakable reference as the title, the general theory, I'm sure he thought would be seen as to Einstein. And what was Einstein's uh, theory about? It was about the interaction between space and time, the interaction between mass and movement, about the relevance of the structure of the whole to the behavior of every individual uh, particle that moves around in, 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 in space. Uh, that's what uh, Keynes was trying to do in economics to say that there is a macroeconomics which is all which which is essentially a framework for all of economics it cannot be separated from it cannot you, the silly business that we do in which we teach micro in one semester and macro in the other and give you a Christmas break to try and forget a, one before you pick up the other uh, this is not Keynes's idea Keynes's idea is there's a single integrated uh, economics which has a structure given by the macrostructure of the economy. Uh, so uh, hey, I don't think he succeeded, uh, certainly not in the United States, in conveying that message effectively, although it was very much part of my own education, which was partly uh, carried out many years ago at the University of Cambridge, when some of Keynes's direct collaborators, uh, John Robinson, Nicholas Kelder, were still 
uh, was still active. Uh, so I, I was never under the illusion that you would take micro and macro and have them as sort of two not coherent, not connected doctrines and keep them both one in one half of your brain and the other in the other half. It never made any sense to me. And it wouldn't have made, it didn't make sense to Keynes either. And that's what he was trying to, 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 to get at. Um, so um, time moves on uh, and uh, uh, with the success of the New Deal and the influence of the general theory, uh, the next big event uh, is the Second World War. Uh, and when you ask, okay, we tend not to think about the Second World War as being something which uh, you know, has important consequences for thinking about economic issues, but in fact it does. Uh, it's just that we, <laughs> it's inconvenient to mention them. Uh, what the Second World War contributed was a comprehensive framework for the collaboration between the public, government, they drive for military success, industry, uh, which had to produce the, the material uh, for to uh, the, the tanks, the planes, and, uh, the, the artillery and the ammunition and so forth uh, to carry out a, 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 an a war on an industrial scale. Uh, and that was organized by economists who were strongly uh, influenced by Keynes and in, 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 you know, or working in, 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 in parallel with him, you know, trying to figure out how to measure the overall structure of the economy. But there was another big issue in wartime, and that was what happens to prices. Prices were always the Achilles heel of countries that went to war. Uh, because once, they, once, once a war happens, all kinds of things that were previously sort of normal and usual get screwed up. Supply chains get screwed up. You can't get certain commodities. Certain commodities, certain things simply become unavailable because uh, they're needed for the war effort. They have to be conserved. In World War II, a big example was rubber. Um, there was no artificial rubber had not been yet had been patented, but it, the factories were still 18 months or so away from being completed. There were natural rubber stockpiles and the Japanese were moving quickly after December 7th, 1941, down to Malaya to cut off the supplies of natural rubber to the United States. Um, so it had to be conserved. That was a, you know, that you couldn't buy the next two days after Pearl Harbor, you couldn't buy a rubber tire anywhere in the United States. The reason you couldn't buy a rubber tire was that there was an edict that was put out uh, that Sunday, uh, maybe Sunday night, um, and the guy who drafted that edict uh, was uh, uh, an economist working with a lawyer uh, who worked for something called the Office of Price Administration and Civilian Supply. Didn't have authority to rush rubber tires, ban their sale. But uh, they went around that night to the commissioners who did have the authority, said, here's the order, sign it, uh, and um, went to the radio, went to their phones, called the radio stations, read the order, it was broadcast the next morning. Done. The guy who drafted that order was actually my, my, my father, who became the uh, 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 deputy administrator in charge of prices for the Office of Price Administration in the Second World War. And uh, he's the gentleman on the left uh, depicted in this wonderful painting that I also happen to own uh, by Edward Sorrell, the cartoonist for The New Yorker. Um, and uh, it, it depicts an event in at the office of the Office of Price Administration in 1942, uh, when my father received an unannounced, unexpected uh, visit from uh, this other fellow, uh, who his secretary uh, heard the name and wrote it down, K-E-E-N-S, Keynes. Well, it was John Maynard Keynes. Um, my father said St. Peter had come to visit the parish priest. Uh, Keynes actually wanted to talk about pigs and well, corn, ho hogs and corn, and pigs and maize in Keynes's language. Um, and that's why there's a photo there. there uh, Sorrell manages them admiring a photograph of a pig. Um, at the, at even, the, the, the meeting did happen, but the, it, what it stresses it to me and symbolically conveys is that the control of prices uh, was not something that you leave to a market in any situation in which you have um, a stress on the overall system. 
because that creates vulnerability, it creates, creates opportunities to gouge, to take on profits, to, that further disrupts supply chains. And once you let that get out of control, you lose the morale of the population, their willingness to cooperate, their willingness to save, they all try and find some, some, some asset they can put their money in and drive the price of that up, land, houses, cars, whatever it might be. Um, and you end up with a general uh, breakdown of uh, the smooth functioning of the society. And that's what the Office of Price Administration was there to stop. It, it worked for five years. My dad was there for a year and he was politically so toxic that he was dismissed. Uh, Roosevelt brought in an advertising executive who'd been governor of Connecticut, uh, Chester Bowles, uh, who uh, uh, imposed a freeze and, and got 300,000 volunteers around the country uh, to enforce it. So it became the greatest exercise in economic democracy uh, in the history of, of, of the United States, maybe in the history of the world. Uh, it's a business that had to respond to panels of local local consumers, many of them women, uh, saying, you know, you can't raise the price of that or this or the other thing because it's we're under a freeze to the end of the war. Uh, that was also part, uh, as you can see from Keynes's interest in the function of this, of the of the broader structure of of, of the of the economics that uh, uh, he was hoping would become the characteristic. Um, uh, doctrine and uh, system of the, of the post-war period. Keynes did not live uh, to the post-war period. My father lived uh, to it, through it, and uh, to a great old age, passing away at 97 in 2006, and produced oh, an uncounted number of books, something like 45 over the course of that life. But here are the four uh, that uh, really defined his has defined his reputation in the 1950s and the 1960s. Um, you can see the, the, the first one, American Capitalism, was published in 1952, happens to be the year I was born. Uh, it was very, uh, sold very effectively. It was, uh, you can see it's decorated with a piece of New Deal art. That's very characteristic New Deal neural art uh, of, uh, of, of the 1930s. The doctor, the, the, what, what, the, what would distinguish that book was the idea that uh, the American system, American capitalist system, was a system we called countervailing power, in which you had corporations, which are very important, very powerful, but they were offset to a strong degree by strong trade unions, by, uh, uh, by government, uh, by consumer organizations, and by also the independent voice of, 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 of intellectuals. Uh, so that uh, there was a system in which that he argued uh, the power was constrained not by markets, not by buying and selling and this kind of thing, uh, but by the, uh, the, the way in which organizations interact with each other. Uh, the second title is, uh, is, is uh, a, a progenitor, if you like, of, of, of modern monetary theory. Uh, it's a, a book on the, on the Great Crash that he wrote over a summer in 1954, I think published in 55. Uh, and it was the first real history of what happened to the stock market in, in 1929. And so it's a book which has um, uh, not been out of print except for very briefly, uh, I think in 1987 uh, since then. Uh, and it's, uh, um, it continues to sell uh, every time there's a, a crisis of some kind, somebody like Warren Buffett says, that's the book you need to read, uh, which is always, I'm always very happy about that because I'm, I'm, I own the, <laughs> two thirds of the, uh, of, of the estate on these things at this point. Uh, so it's a little modest source of continuing income, uh, but it's a, it's a very lively account and uh, uh, it, underlines the uh, instability of, a, of, of the credit system and, to, and also the, the extent to which uh, people participating speculatively in markets tend to delude themselves about uh, you know, how long this is going to last uh, and what is and what is not a good investment uh, and also the extent to which these markets are, are prone to the most imaginative forms of fraud. Uh, so looking at this in, in in, in retrospect in 1929 is a nice thing to do because it gives you a lot of insight into things you're going to encounter uh, all through your lives as you keep an eye on the financial pages or have an interest in participating in markets. Uh, the third book here, Affluent Society, was my father's first real effort to overthrow uh, the uh, still then ongoing uh, doctrines of 
classical and neoclassical, the neoclassical economics. Um, it's a book was published in 1958. I was six years old. It's, my name is on the dedication page, so I'm really fond of this book. Um, but it's, a, it's, it's, it's a substantially what it attempts to do is to say that the kind of society that we live in is really not the society of scarcity that economics textbooks refer to. It's a society of abundance, and that brings its own problems. It brings its own problems of inequality, of pollution, environmental degradation, of urban blight, of unbalanced imbalance between what the public sector, the quality, the poor quality of the public sectors and the high quality of things you can buy in the private market. Uh, there's a private opulence and public squalor. Uh, was a phrase that emerges in that book. Uh, and that was a foundational document for um, a great many things that, that came to fruit in the 1960s, including environmentalism, feminism, uh, to some degree, the civil rights movement. Uh, I, I was told once that uh, when Martin Luther King was in the Birmingham jail, writing the letter from the Birmingham jail, which is a famous testament, uh, he had two books with him. And uh, one of them was the Bible, and the other one was this one. Uh, so uh, it was a document of, 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 of really great importance. And I'm, I'm sure for a popular market, it greatly outsold anything Keynes wrote, uh, except possibly well, even the economic consequences of the piece. Um, as it was really addressed to a mass market. It was a kind of book that every, every college undergraduate in my, or the generation, the years just before mine, uh, read. And that was the same was true of the, of, the, of the fourth book, The New Industrial State, which came out in 1967 marked kind of the apogee of, uh, of my father's contribution. The argument of that book was that uh, you had to really understand the, the organizational imperatives of the large industrial corporation. So between these, in this period, 52 to 67, you're really looking at a chronicle of the, of the high, uh, highest moments of American capitalism, the period in which the United States was really dominant in the world uh, and in which the organizational models uh, of the actual existing US economy were you know, by and large widely admired, although they had uh, flaws, which, uh, uh, which my father was a very important uh, uh, chronicler of and instigator of, uh, of various reform movements. Um, you know, he was a very practical person. Uh, and so much of what his, he did here, the appeal of it was that it was not drawn, certainly wasn't drawn from academic economics. He'd been, I should have mentioned, he was, he'd been a, raised on a farm. Uh, he was, a, uh, he was an editor um, at Fortune magazine uh, in the early, during, partly during the war and partly in the early post-war period. Uh, he'd spent a number of months uh, as the um, director of a survey of the effects of strategic bombing on Germany and Japan. Um, and then he emerged here uh, as, a, as a, perhaps the, I think fair to say the leading uh, chronicler of the American economic condition uh, of, of, of this period. Um, so that uh, gives you a sense of, the, of, 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 of where uh, these intellectual traditions uh, between uh, from games to my father fit in. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say a word about myself uh, uh, just to wrap up and then open up to, to, to questions. I, I came along, of course, uh, came of age uh, in the early, as a professional in the early mid 1970s, uh, had some very interesting and high positions uh, in the, on the staff of the US Congress in the um, late 70s and especially the first four years of the 1980s, when I was kind of the, uh, in the trenches trying to resist the, the onslaught of the so-called Reagan revolution as the staff director of the Joint Economic Committee. But even before that, when I was very young, I was involved in uh, oversight of monetary policy and uh, regulation, of, uh, setting, us, setting the terms of the, of, 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 um, of, um, the, uh, the, the basic rules for, the, for, for economic policy. This, Humphrey Hawkins Full Employment and Balanced Growth Act. I was involved in the drafting of that. Uh, when uh, Chairman Powell goes up next month, early next month, to give his testimony before the uh, House Banking Committee, 
which I do, I think, in early March. Uh, that is for hearings that I created in the middle 1970s that have been going on ever since. Uh, so these are, these are the, my, my, my role, I was raised not on a farm, but basically on a campus. Um, I came of age in the first really difficult post-war decade, which was the 1970s. Um, and then I was stranded, if you like, by the Reagan counter-revolution and the rise uh, once again of these market fundamentalist uh, Thatcherite, Margaret Thatcherite uh, ideas in which, uh, which still dominate the textbooks. Uh, and so from an intellectual standpoint, I've always been an outsider. Uh, and uh, I've always been, uh, partly because of my political uh, or origins in my, in my, in my career and, and, and public life. And it's been closely connected to, uh, to financial crises. The first of which actually was came along when I'd been working for only about three weeks uh, in the, at the banking committee uh, in 1975, the New York City's banks had told the city that they were not gonna roll over $4 billion of loans, precipitating the famous New York City financial crisis. So uh, I'll, 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 I'll say just briefly how that affected me. I was I was sitting at a desk much like the ones that you're sitting at, just outside the office of the chairman of the banking committee who hired me, but hadn't yet given me a, a even a cubicle over in the banking committee's premises. He walks out past, and we need to go uh, to a meeting. So I trailed after him. We went over to a, one of the other house office buildings and there was a meeting with the whole New York City congressional delegation. And the most people from 50 years ago were very colorful people. Bella Ebbs, I don't think if these names mean anything to you, but you can look them up if they don't. Charlie Rangel, um, Elizabeth Holtzman, uh, rather legendary figures in New York politics, New York City politics. Ed Koch, uh, who later became mayor, all were there. Um, and they were all very worried by this and wanted to explore the possibility that the federal government would get involved to help New York City through this uh, and provide assistance uh, and a restructuring plan. And Royce listened for about 10 minutes and he said, this is Henry Royce who was the chairman of the banking and he said, don't worry, my staff will have a plan for you in the morning. And I thought, staff? Oh. I was 23 years old. That was the first major project I got involved in, in on Capitol Hill in those days. Uh, so any of it, I have begun ever since something of an ambulance chaser of financial crises uh, and uh, have the somewhat ambiguous good fortune that the crises have gotten worse and bigger. And as a result of that, uh, my expertise and experience has gotten deeper and more profound on every, every disaster. Uh, has developed. Uh, luckily, I was able to escape Washington and uh, find a safe haven and a, 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 at, a, at a reasonable distance in Central Texas, uh, from which I continue to observe and, and, and participate in these things. These are some of the books here that, uh, that have emerged from that over the years. The most recent one being this little book on the right lower right corner, which chronicled five months that I spent attempting to help Greece escape from the clutches of its bankers and its creditors in the European Central Bank. We did not succeed. That was in 2015. Uh, so whereas uh, Keynes was able to uh, chronicle and uh, provide a, a kind of blueprint for the, uh, uh, the construction of a new world uh, in the New Deal and the, and, and, and the mobilization for World War II and leading on to the post war period, and whereas my father played an important institutional role in actually bringing that world into being, and I've only touched on there were many different things, and then played a very much even more important role as a chronicler and um, theorist of uh, the actual existing um, uh, American system. Uh, I've had the somewhat more dubious uh, uh, a point of perspective, a point of view, a vantage point of, of having had a career in the same field as as uh, as everything was going to hell, uh, and the system's in a state of of of, of repeated uh, crises, uh, compounded by uh, by perpetual mismanagement, uh, fraud, uh, and predation, which uh, is my most complete effort to describe that as this book called the Predator State. So uh, that you know, gives us a gives you a synopsis, I guess, and brings you up into the modern age to a certain degree. 
uh, and uh, as all I have prepared for you. So I would be happy to uh, uh, stop at this point and uh, let you raise questions or engage in any kind of dialogue that you might have. I see some hands going up. Uh, so the only thing I would ask is that you um, maybe come forward where, because my hearing is, is uh, uh, it, it's considerably uh, worse than Professor Kelton's. Uh, and, uh, uh, <laughs> so uh, either that or, or Stephanie, perhaps you can, you can relate. I can questions. amplify if necessary, but you're yeah, all welcome yeah. to come closer. Mm -hmm. Well, we have, a, I'm not sure where the audio is captured from our end. Is it through the room or only it's through this? Through yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So it's through the microphone. Well, go ahead. And if necessary, I will amplify. Yeah. Okay. Um, I noticed that your titles are a lot more grim than your father's in pain. Why do you think that is? And was that your intention? Why do I think my situ my experience has been grimmer no, than my father's? Your book, uh, titles, your book uh, titles. Your book titles. Oh, why my book titles are grimmer? Well, because my experience is grimmer because I live in a more uh, unstable and, uh, you know, essentially in a situation in which, which I think we may see coming to a, to a head fairly soon, uh, in which uh, much of the promise uh, that of a, uh, um, you know, let's say steady advance uh, under uh, you know, good organizational control that was, you know, customary for people to think of in, in the in the 50s and 60s has been dissipated. Uh, beginning really very, quite early in my life with the Vietnam War was a disillusioning experience. But then in the 1970s, one had uh, one, one had the loss of of international control over uh, over exchange rates and a very unstable period, which got replaced in the 1980s. Uh, by a regime of very high interest rates, very strong U.S. dollar, which then proceeded to deindustrialize the core of the country, and that's what essentially gave us Donald Trump in 2016. Was he was able to capitalize on the, the anger that was there from places like Michigan and Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, the three states that 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 turned against the Democrats in that election, because they felt that they had, and quite rightly, that they had been over a very long period of time. Uh, not only neglected, but actively sacrificed to other regions of the country, which were dominated by finance on the East Coast and by technology, armaments, information technology on the West Coast, very prosperous, but a very uneven path of pattern of development. Um, and then also very unstable, as you can, anything that's basically dominated by finance is subject to a kind of Minsky process in which uh, um, making a reference to Hyman Minsky that I hope if it's not obscure and if it is obscure, it will surely not be obscure for long, uh, that uh, it is essentially uh, destabilizing. Uh, so that's the kind of country that I've grown, I've, I've grown old in uh, and it's, um, uh, it's not as happy an experience. Uh, and, you know, I, I have to say, you know, perhaps also that uh, the fact that I was a high school, more or less contemporary of, uh, well, not of George W. Bush, but of his younger brother, uh, Jeb. Uh, and so I grew up in a certain milieu that I really came heartily to detest over the course of a long uh, period of uh, having to deal with them. Uh, left me with a, 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 without without the good cheer that my my father's generation was able to muster. Yes, go right ahead. Um, so how do you get rid of a corporate republic when corporations have so much lobby power? Try that one more time. How do you get rid of a corporate republic, republic when corporations have so much lobbying power? Well, you have to have alter you have to have independent institutions that are uh, able to, uh, you know, that, that have that are able to enforce uh, essentially viable regulations. This is an actually a principle. I think that one of the things I'm trying to develop as a uh, as an underlying principle for thinking about economic systems is that uh, put it this way: uh, when you pick up a typical textbook, there's this concept of regulation. Um, they uh, uh, and it's kind of an add-on. The market equilibrates supply and demand. Uh, and uh, if there's an externality pollution or something like that, uh, you need a regulatory framework to, to, uh, to deal with it. 
Um, this is not right. This is a fundamentally misleading story. The story I would tell is that, uh, uh, you know, hold on just a second. Uh, can I, can we pause for just a quick second? Yes. Apparently I've got someone downstairs who's waiting to get into my house to do some work. Yes. I'm terribly sorry about that. I wasn't expecting it. It'll take me two minutes, Stephanie, to come back nope. and resume. Nope. No problem. No problem. Yep. We will. Yep. You want to be right back? Yourself? Yeah. Copy there. Anyway. Okay. Oh, can't you do it on your side? You can use him. Let's but see, but we are going to try something different. But it's going all the way downstairs. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let me see. Show of him. I want to try. No, I will. Okay. 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 For me? Yeah, was the sewing system a part of the new deal? I know, I know it came about like 10 years after. I, I didn't think so, but it, I could be wrong, and I haven't been in it for more than. So no, it's like a little off topic. Yeah. I think it was during 19. Well, it's about 60. Yeah. It's not a new deal. Yeah. Uh, Sorry about that. It's 37 degrees here, and I couldn't leave the poor fellow waiting outside. Uh, okay. So I gave this idea of, of that I think was probably familiar to the role of regulation. But when you think about it, every market for every significant item that you ever bought or ever will buy exists only because of a proper system of regulation. And when I say, uh, you know, they're, they're laptop computers. Just look on them, you'll see there are signs of the regulatory standards for electrical equipment, for example, that they have to meet. Uh, there's a uh, there, there, so there's not only external regulation, but there's also uh, to make them work at all, they have to be designed with a regulatory framework built in. Uh, they have to have a regulator of the electrical current that passes through the system. If you buy an automobile, guess what? The oil is a regulatory system. The radiator is a regulatory system. Uh, and if you get to my age and I hope you will, uh, you know, monitor your blood pressure. That's a regulatory system. You know, if you need to take medicine to regulate it, take the medicine. It's a good idea. Uh, these are, it's a basic principle. Any system has, requires energy. It has materials. The energy is passing through the system has to be within the tolerance of the materials. And the same is true for any kind of economic system, any kind of product. You know, you don't, you don't get on an airplane if the air traffic controllers are not functioning. Because the airplane may be a perfectly excellent piece of equipment, but if it hits another airplane in the air, this is not good news. It's very bad for the, for the passengers uh, and anybody who happens to be underneath. So this is my position is that the whole, really the, the whole process of economic development is a process of proper regulation. Uh, and what happens is you can put technology anywhere. You can take a, you can have education and you do have education, excellent education all over the world. Um, and you, with a certain amount of basic infrastructure, so you, can, you can put a factory anywhere. Uh, but in order to, for example, uh, be willing, have people willing to eat fresh uh, lettuce uh, at a restaurant or in their homes, um, it has to be grown under certain conditions and those conditions uh, are effectively you're assured that that's the case um, by regulation. Uh, so regulation is the essence of a, of, of, of a functioning market system and in in the way I, way I think it's a proper thing about it. Problem with finance is that there's, you know, for, for the laptops I see, there's an, you know, there's an electrical engineering standard uh, that ensures that you plug it in, you don't get an electric shock. Uh, for the lettuce, there's a, um, the phytosanitary standard. Uh, if it's a bridge, there's a, you know, there's an engineering standard that says it's strong enough, it's not going to fall down. 
what's what is their finance? There's no such external standard. It's a pure money game. So there you have to have rules of ethical conduct, laws and regulations, and you have to have people who are there to enforce them. Uh, so that you, uh, the tendency to, to skirt, to bend the rules and break them and make a little more money is always going to be extremely strong. And the whole society depends upon having something, again, a countervailing force, countervailing power to ensure that doesn't get out of hand. You don't want to repress it all together. It's not a bad thing. People want to make money. No, nothing against it. But uh, once it becomes a pure mafia operation in which nobody trusts uh, anybody to act with, uh, you know, with integrity, uh, then the, the institutions are not going to last for very long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. You brought up earlier that like deindustrialization is sort of what led to the rise of Trump and most stuff happened in the eighties. But like, what is the path forward? Like, how do you fix that situation? Because I don't think like bringing coal mining back to West Virginia is especially desirable. Okay, so there are the, the questions about the deindustrialization there, and there are a couple of things going on. One, one is that sort of things change in the world. Uh, well, we can't deny that. In the 1930s and 40s, um, you know, and particularly in the unstable in the environment of the Second World War, North America was a really very, very advantageous position. Uh, you think about it. the iron ore was up there in Minnesota, the coal was in Pennsylvania. In between, you had the Great Lakes, they were perfectly protected internal waterway. Uh, you could put your steel mills on the shores in Gary, Indiana, Youngstown, Ohio, places like that. Uh, and you, you, this was, you know, this, this was natural, it, this was a fortress for, uh, a natural fortress for industrial development on very favorable terms. No, it's not true anymore. Uh, if you have, you know, a, a relatively peaceful world, uh, and uh, you know, you get iron ore from Australia and uh, you know, coal from Wyoming or wherever else, you get natural gas from Siberia. Uh, it may make sense to put the metalworks someplace else. You're not going to move them around to to the to to the same places. So there's a there that part of that's a sort of a, as a process of global development and, and the success of the international system. Uh, part of it, though, uh, was the way in which policy accelerated that process enormously, uh, and that happened. Uh, I was watching in the early 1980s. I was I was I was the staff director of the Joint Economic Committee beginning in January of '81, which is just at the moment that the Federal Reserve raised interest rates to 20%. And what happened then was that the, the value of the US dollar went up in, in, in when you weighted by the current currencies we actually trade with, it was 60%. Standard measures like 40 is still an enormous amount. Unprecedented. So the dollar was very, very valuable. That meant the companies that were normally had, you know, had needed export markets, had export markets, stopped having them. Companies from Germany and Japan that sold machinery in particular, they, they took over the US markets. Uh, eventually the automobile industry went the same way. Um, Japanese and German and later Korean producers. Um, and then you know, along comes the People's Republic of China um, beginning in really in the 1990s and 2000s um, as, a, uh, as a participant in this system on an absolutely colossal scale. Uh, so uh, what that says to me is, if you wanted to avoid the debacle that happened and the, the kind of decay that set in in the upper Midwest, you had to, you had to use your imagination and have to have resources to rebuild the area, uh, to redevelop it. To, you, know, you can just leave this to be something that somebody might go around to someday. Uh, you had to have kind of an active, an active policy. We didn't have that. And the result of that was, you know, people moved to Texas, they moved to California. Uh, and you had this sort of kind of political imbalance uh, that uh, continues to be, you know, the, 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 uh, the, if you like, the you know, defining feature of American politics, actually. Uh, but the thing is that if you compare the GDP of the world bank, that 
those two countries accounts have been stagnant or very slow growth for the past 20 years. And because that the US uh, essentially now stuck in this economy, how do you reconcile that? That one was muddy to me. I have to ask Stephanie if you could give me a. There, he, said, he is uh, arguing that the US has performed less well in terms of GDP growth relative. I'm sorry, I meant to say it the other way around. That the US has outperformed the combined uh, performance of uh, Japan, South Korea, and Germany. And Germany. Over what period of time are you making this argument? Over the last couple of decades. And how do you how do you explain that? Well, um, first of all, uh, there's an there's some accounting issues here. Uh, it's true that if you 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 take the the dollar value of the uh, of, of of the GDP, which is constructed with a very strong element of the financial sector and the high technology sectors, uh, real estate sectors. The, uh, these, are, these things have grown. There's no question about that. And their value in world markets has held up because the dollar has held up. Uh, the dollar continues to hold up and with some luck, it may still continue to hold up, uh, but we'll see because it, it's in, on increasingly uh, kind of ethereal foundation. And that's an issue that 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 uh, is, is really highly imponderable at the present time. Uh, what happened in Japan and Germany was also a process of maturation, uh, and uh, that leads to um, slower growth. Uh, in particular, both countries are suffering from suffering from. I know this in the right word. They're experiencing very slow population growth, and I think uh, actually in Germany there's a ongoing population decline. Uh, so that's a factor in terms of how much GDP you can you can generate. In the U.S., the population growth has been very strong, uh, largely because of immigration, uh, which is, just isn't the same in Germany and hardly exists at all in Japan. Uh, at the same time, though. Uh, I would argue that both Germany and Japan have um, used their resources uh, much more effectively than we have uh, for the maintenance of living standards. So when we look at Japan uh, and say, okay, uh, you know, it's, it's been in the state of secular stagnation since the early 1990s. Well, and, you know, actually, we go there and look around, you say, it's doing pretty well, actually. There's not as though people are out on the streets uh, uh, as they are all over the United States uh, in uh, living in cardboard. Uh, they, and so what's going on? They, a lot more investment in public goods, in goods that are of common use, uh, kind of common consumption, uh, and infrastructure, uh, and uh, a more balanced and equitable sharing out of the GDP that exists. And all of these things say, uh, yeah, okay, the GDP number looks good for the United States, but is it, a, is it a proper measure of the relative position of these societies? I would argue it isn't. Uh, and, and, you know, the GDP is indifferent to the distribution. That's another thing. Uh, the, uh, the, the GDP, it, 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 you add a hundred million dollars to the income of Jeff Bezos or uh, or Bill Gates or somebody like that to their income, not their capital value. And that's a hundred million of GDP. Uh, uh, but uh, that's uh, uh, very different socially from, from let's say adding 50,000 uh, to uh, the uh, income of uh, what uh, 20,000 or whatever it is people that would get up to the same number. Other questions? Go ahead. So would you say that all like economic depressions and recessions, so like the obviously the Great Depression, stagflation in the 1970s, the 2008 um, financial crisis is all due to a lack of ethical standards in the economic systems? Ah. Uh, um... That, for the Great Depression, that wasn't quite Keynes's argument. It was it was that there was a 
underlying psychological basis for accumulation. It's not necessarily, it, you can you treat it as kind of ethical, ethical is not far off, uh, but it's not quite the same thing. It's just say so there was a kind of class compromise in the way in which people who had money used it in the Victorian period, they were saved rather than, uh, rather than uh, spent lavishly on their own enjoyments. Uh, this is Keynes's argument. And this was different from the behavior of the landed classes in the 18th century that got them uh, basically displaced by revolutions. Uh, so, uh, and that psychological structure of society, which is the basic argument in the economic consequences of the peace, collapses with the Great War. Um, is uh, now let's say you, the, the, there were there were two, you had two more periods that you wanted me to, the, the, the great financial crisis and one one in between. Yeah, the like 1970s stagflation. Oh, the stagflation. Uh, the stagflation uh, was, I would argue, a, a common, basically the consequence of, of um, a series of, of, of policy um, contradictions, I, I hesitate to use the word mistakes, but basically incompatible policies and the adjustments of them. One of them was the Vietnam War, which uh, uh, basically depleted the financial reserves of the United States and made the, the Bretton Woods system untenable. Uh, and then uh, the, the movement to, uh, to a flexible exchange rate system in 1971, 73, but then produced a series of, of, of adjustments that we experienced as price shocks, uh, particularly oil prices in 74, and then again with the Iranian revolution in 79. Um, and then the, those shocks were then dealt with by policymakers by raising interest rates, uh, which we're now about to see again. Uh, so stagflation was created to a substantial extent by the Federal Reserve. and. Uh, you know, over uh, was what you know one of the one of my, one of the first of my many many losing battles uh, was it <laughs> raising objections to that back in the back in the early mid 1970s uh, so there's that uh, and then when you come to the third one the great financial crisis yep that was a collapse that was a a fundamentally financial debacle brought about fundamentally by the essentially criminal criminal takeover of the financial system. Uh, in the form of uh, the massive expansion, money making from the issuance of, of mortgages that the mortgage lenders knew could not be repaid, would never be repaid, on terms that they knew would were, were going to explode in two or three years as the mortgages were structured that way, uh, in terms that the ratings agencies corruptly validated by uh, uh, giving these the bundles of mortgages a high ratings in terms that the uh, that regulators look the other way. And uh, the whole exercise was a massive, uh, and then and of course the marketing uh, under fraudulent uh, representations and guarantees uh, to uh, pension funds and foreign investors and so on and so forth. It was, it was, it was, there was fraud and criminality uh, through the system from one end to the other. And that was fundamentally the source of the uh, of the crisis, the the great work on this is 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 is, is our friend uh, Bill Black, um, who was um, my colleague for a while here at the LBJ School and and Stephanie's colleague uh, at the University of Missouri, uh, and who was the you know who understood this from inside out because he'd been the chief litigator uh, for the Federal Home Loan Bank Board in the early uh, 1980s, uh, and saw the process unfolding and what became was known as the savings and loan debacle. Um, at that time, you know, uh, there's there's a there's a clear body of work about how this happens, and it's, it's something that's particularly distinctive to finance for the reason I explained earlier. There's no independent standard uh, except ethics. Uh, it's as I say, if it if it were electrical engineering, you would know because when you plug the thing in, it would either catch fire or you'd get a shock. It's, uh, Can I ask one more question? Did you, don't feel pressured, but if you would like to ask a question, if you not, I will ask one. You want me to read your question? All right. I have been asked to read a question. It's quite long. Oh, wow. In the interview, 
you were asked about your point regarding say what finance and technology you used transportation as an example you mentioned that your father grew up on a farm where the plowing was done by teams of horses and you don't need a gas station um, you don't need a mechanic now horses were replaced by tractors and the carriage into town was replaced by the automobile so based on this explanation you're giving and then things are crossed out and written in the margin so mm -hmm. let me see Based on the explanations you're giving, what? I think, I, 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 I suspect I know where this is going. If so. we continue this pattern, my question is, how do you vision our future generations? Yeah, so uh, the, 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 the basic story here, which I, I, I draw this particular example of uh, the replacement of the horse by automotive transport, uh, is that you brought a lot of functions that were basically household functions into the market. And people got around before there were automobiles. Uh, it wasn't as fast, it wasn't as convenient. No, it was, uh, the air was filled with, uh, with horse droppings and so forth, uh, but they were there. Um, and uh, they, were not, they, they, they were not provided for substantially by in in the market the horses fed themselves on your your back lot and all of that and a lot of the of, of the care and um, was was basically household work and this was true of, of all kinds of things i mean it wasn't just wasn't just transportation all kinds of things so with the mechanical revolution you would need a whole lot of infrastructure and you need you need repair facilities and all of these things become cash uh, part of the cash nexus, part of the transactions based, and they therefore enter in uh, to what we calculate as GDP. And so a certain function moves from a non-market to a market setting. GDP goes up not only because there's more actual activity, but also because some things that were previously being done off books become done on books. Right. So the, 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 the thought that I have is that uh, what's happening to us now is the reverse process as a result of a next wave of technologies. Uh, for example, uh, to be very precise about it, three years ago, if we had wanted to have this conversation, Professor Kelton would have bought me an airplane ticket, uh, would have bought me a hotel a room for a night or two, uh, would have compensated a, a taxi, uh, would have paid some restaurant meals, um, and maybe some hangover medicine and God knows what. Um, yeah, and even we, you know, you know, these conferences, you'd go and go out of an evening in, in Kansas City to uh, what was the name of that excellent uh, disco? And uh, uh, the, uh, yeah, um, so where all the economists would, would get loose on the dance floor. Uh, and none of, you know, to do this now, none of this happens. All we do is I sit at my desk. Uh, flip on my computer, all the costs are paid, uh, and uh, we're getting an experience which, from your point of view, is essentially the same. Uh, it's not, it's, you know, it's uh, okay, a little bit two dimensional compared to what I would be in flesh and blood, but aside from that, you're hearing the same, same words and uh, we're having the same exchange. It's fine. Right? And you can do this any number of times, uh, and it doesn't add a dime. Uh, to the GDP, which it did before. Right? And you think about all of the ways in which this technology is, is having this effect on your experience of music, of movies, of uh, newspapers, of uh, your, your, your own commuting, uh, the, whether you're, the company you work for has to maintain a downtown office building of the same scale. And you can see that this, this, this is going to show up in the statistics. Uh, it's going to show up as a slower rate of growth or maybe even an actual decline in the total value of economic output, even though there's no real welfare loss associated with it. In some ways, there's a gain, right? I, 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 again, jet lag, hangovers, a general deterioration that comes from having dragging yourself through airports, all these things uh, are not you know, no, no longer so big a part of life. 
uh, I, I, I give up the GDP and for the, some of that benefit. I have two questions and we have a little, about 10 minutes left, but I'm gonna put them both to you so that you can decide how much time to spend okay. on each of them. In Carter's book, somewhere in I think the second of the two chapters that you asked us to read, he talks about the shift in policy dependence, if you like, from using relying mainly on fiscal policy with monetary policy playing a very explicit and subordinate role to one in which monetary policy becomes the policy yep. expected to deal with disruptions in the economy and so forth. And he's somewhere in there he says that you know your father was strongly opposed to the use of interest rates right to rein in inflationary pressures that something like this was the cruelest and most immoral of the ways to deal with inflationary pressures and i think he says it was solo who said well sure he would say that right and zach sort of has a throwaway line something like solo was of course correct on this and he suggests that it was your dad's ego in a way that it was he wanted to go back to the old the good old days of price controls to deal with inflationary pressures did it, i want to know what you think Zach got right or wrong not just there but if you think there are other important ways in which you think Zach didn't get things exactly right in those two chapters that we read and then oh, i last, don't know that he that he's the he's last question that. is this yeah. was your father a capitalist um, okay, so the short answer to the second question is no. Uh, he was a new dealer uh, with uh, social democratic uh, 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 loyalties. He was prepared at some point to describe himself as a socialist, but he really wasn't a socialist. He was a new dealer all the way through, institutionalist. Uh, and this is a post-capitalist uh, 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 the institutionalist qua Keynesian, the, the institutionalism was stronger than the Keynesianism. Uh, and this is a post-capitalist uh, body of thinking. Uh, it is in design, it comes into its own as a response to the collapse of capitalism in the, uh, uh, in the early 1930s. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, I, I, along with my father, I don't ever believe that capitalism ever was really restored. The attempts to restore it are, are repetitive and they always end up pretty quickly in disaster. Uh, so we have an illusion of living under, uh, under something that we call capitalism that's not at all continuous with a system that existed before the New Deal. So that's the, that's the answer to the second question. The answer to the first question is, I think Zach has pretty well got that right. Solo, um, really, I have a good relationship with Solo, actually, personally. He reached out to me quite early in my career with correspondence, and we got along very well. Uh, uh, he was dismissive uh, to the, particularly to the new industrial state. There was a furious uh, exchange of reviews and responses uh, in that. Uh, I don't know that they ever spoke again, although he did come to my dad's memorial. Uh, and. Um, and I got him to speak uh, uh, to a little conference that we held some months later at Harvard to give a keynote. Uh, my mother was not happy with my choice of solo to speak. I said, it'll be all right, it was all right. Uh, but, uh, uh, but yes, there was this period when, this, uh, when the real opposition to my father's positions was from uh, his neighbors in Cambridge and MIT. Uh, and um, Samuelson always stayed as a friend. Solo uh, uh, played uh, a more uh, cutting role. Paul Krugman in his way is, is uh, my father was always very generous to Paul Krugman, which was not true um, a, in reverse. Um, but, um, my father had a, a capacity to be generous to, to a lot of people. Uh, even, even, even to Ronald Reagan, who we always, always would remind everybody they had been co-founders of Americans for Democratic Action, along with Arthur Schlesinger and Eleanor Roosevelt in 1947. Um, so, um, that was 
uh, my father had a generosity which I, which I I, I, I try to uh, to to emulate, but I don't quite succeed uh, all the, all the time. I I haven't been able to extend it to my view of the Bush of of, of the Bush family, for example. On the on the shift to monetary policy. So you think oh, they, they, you know, you know, they, they, they absolutely, they, and, and this was a theme I, I reprised the other day in a piece was on, uh, that uh, if you raise, you raise interest rates, first of all, you're adding to costs, you're not subtracting from them, you're making life more difficult immediately. So what tends to happen is that, that you're accelerating a process of uh, inflationary process in the structure of prices. Uh, and then it only breaks when it gets to be bad enough that businesses quit investing and uh, start laying off workers. So you're basically saying this is a, this is a way of putting the putting the adjustment on the backs of the workforce, which, by the way, has always been uh, bearing the adjustments all along. Uh, so it's a way of protecting uh, capital income streams of one kind or another uh, you know, from from the encroachment of higher wages. Uh, and to my mind, it's uh, it, it 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 was embedded as a kind of doc, textbook doctrine, uh, in a way which was uh, one of the most deeply dishonest uh, and covertly politicized uh, um, uh, experiences of my lifetime. And I was really in the you know in, in the thick of it in, in, when this was happening in the in the mid late nineteen seventies. So it was happening in the way in in. In the uh, in the interaction between the when, between Federal Reserve policy and, and our efforts in the Congress to uh, to shine a critical light on that policy, and that's uh, fundamentally the, the, the hearings that we initiated in those days. That's what it was about. It takes a very brave and uh, well informed member of Congress to carry the load on that, and we happen to have some. Uh, in those days, they're, they're they're much rarer now than they were then. Although I guess Stephanie is doing some work to cultivate a few and maybe bring back that tradition of of critical thinking and uh, 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 and astute and sharp questioning of these um, now hoary accepted doctrines that are, just do nothing but damage. Thank you so very much. We've been asking our Thank you very, very much. That's been a pleasure. Thank you all. And I said, okay. nice to see you. And, uh, uh, you know. Uh, we, will, we will go dancing one day soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. What, uh, so, yeah. Oh, okay. John. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, we'll talk later. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah. Yep.